Good morning. Good morning. I say good morning to our visitors from West Virginia, but you're not visitors. <laughs> but we're so happy to see you. Yes. Yes. Right. Should have been here last weekend for the prodigal son. Yes. <laughs> Psalm 25, verses 8 through 10. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Father in heaven, we thank you that we are here again today to lift up our voices and praise to you. We we'll pray that we give you the honor that you deserve. We thank you that we can meet as a family and that we are together. And Phil and Paula have been here safely to meet with us and we can enjoy their company again. So we pray for those who are not here for reasons out of their own, whether it's traveling or illness, for personal reasons, we pray for them. Pray that uh, whatever their needs are, that we can be in tune with them and, and, and minister to them as needed. We pray for instruction, Father, instruction in your ways, so that we can turn away from our sin, and that we can follow your paths. And we pray that lessons we hear today will encourage us to do so and touch our hearts to, to do so. And it's through your son's name we pray. Amen. Floor number 73. Floor 73. Safe in the arms of Jesus, safe on his gentle breast. Lay by his love for shame, in it sweetly my soul shall rest. Heart is the voice of angels born in a soul.
Fasten to the rock which cannot 
jacket she was completely under the covers so I'm thinking it's a bad one um, so please be praying for Marie uh, let's see Garrett also is not here today he did not sleep well last night his puppy is keeping him awake <laughs> yeah there's a challenge in life so yeah pray for Garrett He's, he's learning responsibility the hard way. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Thank you for this time that we can sing these songs of praise and worship and that we can study a portion of your word. Father, as we dig, dig into this challenging text today, help us to understand what Jesus was saying and learn how to apply it to our lives. Father, I ask that you help me at this time as I give this message that I've prepared. I just pray that I can speak your words and that I will stay out of the way of your message, that I will hinder you in your work. Most of all, Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. Teaching can be challenging. Sometimes it's difficult because the material is difficult to understand, like physics. 
sometimes it's difficult because the students simply are not <clears throat> interested, like physics, <laughs> honestly. That's when teachers need to be creative and make the material interesting so it captures the student's attention. One of the ways that I tried to teach leadership when I was teaching Air Force ROTC was by example. I tried to be the kind of officer that I wanted my students to become. Honest, trustworthy, caring. Now, not all officers in the military are like that. But I told my students they could learn leadership from everyone that they encountered. Some would be good examples, and some would be examples of what not to do. Like I said, I tried to be the first type, but I knew many who were the second. Jesus taught his disciples by example, but also by using parables. He started using parables when the Pharisees started trying to get evidence against him so that they could accuse him of something worthy of death. Now, some of Jesus' parables are honestly quite confusing. They were intended to be confusing to people who were not his followers. But sometimes, sometimes, because we take them out of context, both the context of when they were told and the context <coughs> of where they are in Scripture, they're difficult for us to understand as well. Today we're going to look at one of the, I, would, I think, most discussed <coughs> parables in Luke's writings, the parable of the dishonest manager. We're going to start reading in Luke 16, verse 1. He also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. So Jesus starts out with the main plot line at the very beginning. Nothing is hidden in this story. It's laid out quite plainly. The rich man, who must have been extremely rich, as we will see later in the story, finds out that his manager, the man who actually runs his business ventures, was, quote, wasting his possessions, or in other words, cheating him out of what he deserved. In these days, managers or stewards, depending on the translation you're reading from, were sometimes trusted slaves who had spent their lives in the household being raised as members of the family. Sometimes they were trusted hirelings who were paid either with money or with room and board. This particular manager had been accused of doing something quite unthinkable. He bit the hand that was feeding him, if you will. He was cheating his boss and possibly lining his own pockets at his boss's expense. So his boss does what any good boss would do. Today, even among people who aren't believers, it's called a come to Jesus meeting. <laughs> the boss calls the manager into his office to have words with him. Verse two, and he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management or you can no longer be manager. So the boss confronts the manager with the evidence. Honestly, I never watched the TV show The Apprentice, but I can man imagine the rich man here pointing with his index finger at his manager saying, bring me all the accounting information, bring me your books, you're fired. I don't know how it works when you fire a business manager today, but I do know how it works when someone in the computer department at a company is fired. 
because computer people have access to so much information and can very easily cripple a company. Once they're not a trusted member of the company anymore, they're usually told to pack up their desk and are immediately escorted off the property by security. But this rich man in Jesus' story didn't do that. He gave his business manager the time to gather all the books of accounts and give them to him. Verse 3. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. Obviously, the, the business manager was not a strapping young man and had grown accustomed to being in his management position. He didn't have the strength to become a common laborer, and there was no way he was going to sit on the side of the road and deal with the ridicule of begging. He pondered his situation. Verse 4. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So the manager has his eureka moment. The light bulb comes on. And he knew what he was going to do so that he wouldn't have to dig ditches or sit by the road and beg. He knew that he would lose everything that he had grown accustomed to, the house that he lived in, and all the perks of his position. He knew that he had to find a way to take care of himself. He needed his golden parachute, so he started to work on it. Before he was fired, he never thought he would need one. Verses 5 through 7. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of wood. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then to another, he said, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. So obviously the, the manager's master was a very rich man. It would take a significantly large orchard to make a hundred barrels of oil. The NIV explains that that comes out to around 875 gallons of olive oil. He told the man who owed it to cut his debt in half. The man wrote out a new bill with the amount that he owed. The discount the manager gave this debtor was somewhere near the salary of a common laborer for about a year and a half. The second man's discount wasn't quite as large, but the value was similar. He owed a hundred measures of wheat, as some translations say, a hundred core of wheat. And the NIV says a thousand bushels of wheat. Now that was a tidy sum as well. In a good harvest year, it would take a hundred acres to generate a thousand bushels of wheat. That's a lot of manpower to harvest that wheat. The 20% discount the manager gave this debtor was close to two years salary for the average laborer. But those are just two of the people that he dealt with. Jesus said he called all his master's debtors one at a time and gave them all similar deals. Like I said, the manager knew that he was losing his livelihood, so he knew he needed to be able to provide for himself for the rest of his life. He didn't have time to grow his 401k the way that he was supposed to, 
So he stole the money from his boss and built his retirement at his boss's expense. I mean, what was his boss going to do? Fire him? He's already fired. So there wasn't anything else that he could do, right? This is where we realize that the business manager was a hireling and not a slave. Because if he had been a slave, the results would have been quite different. It probably would have been more like what we read in Matthew 24, verses 50 and 51. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour that he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that's probably what Jesus' audience was expecting in this story. The manager is going to get more than fired. He's going, the boss is going to have him strung up for what he did, and justice will prevail. But this is a parable, and it's time for the twist that Jesus always ends his parables with. Let's look at the first half of Luke 16, verse 8. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. What? Am I reading that wrong? No, that's actually what it says. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. It's probably obvious that last from that last scripture, but in this story, unlike most of the parables that Jesus tells, the master does not represent God or Jesus. Both the master and the dishonest manager represent exactly what they are, ungodly businessmen. Now this kind of story makes me think of a mafia dog and one of his lieutenants who tries to skim the profits from his boss's schemes. The boss is outraged that his trusted lieutenant is cheating him. But he's kind of proud of his lieutenant's ability to trick him and protect himself. So Jesus sums up this parable in one sentence at the end of verse 8. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Jesus is talking about two different groups of people here. The sons of this world and the sons of light. Those who follow God and, those, and do what he requires, those are the sons of light. Everyone else falls into the group, the sons of this world. Today, we tend to call them the unchurched. They don't know God, and they don't know what he requires. But they surely aren't stupid. In fact, Jesus says they know better how to deal with other unchurched people than Christians do. Jesus is pointing out how naive we are, or some of us are at least, when he sent the twelve out to proclaim the kingdom to Israel, Jesus warned his disciples to be careful. He warned them that they were going out where the wolves were in charge. This is in Matthew 10, verse 16. Behold, I am sending you out as a sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent doves. The word that's translated as wise here is the same word that Jesus uses to describe the actions of the sons of this world. That the rich man praised in the actions of his dishonest manager. Shrewd. 
Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines shrewd as marked by clever, discerning awareness and hard-headed acumen or discernment. Jesus' point in this parable is that the sons of light are lacking in that area when it comes to dealing with the sons of this world, the unchurched. In the next four verses, Jesus makes three points about the parable that he just told. Points that clear up what he means by his statement that the sons of the world are more shrewd than the sons of light. If you look at it from an eternal perspective, the sons of this world really aren't that shrewd. They know how to take care of themselves, how to save up for retirement, how to ensure that they will be taken care of during their golden years. But what they fail to consider is what happens after we die. If our souls live on forever, and I think most of us here believe they do, then all that planning and saving is to take care of a small amount of time compared to the eternity that they should be invested in. Jesus' first specific point about this parable is in verse 9. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Now this verse is very easy to misunderstand. What I believe Jesus is saying here is to use your earthly wealth, however much of it we may or may not have, doing good things for other people. Help other people when they're in need and do good for others. And you will be rewarded for it. Not that doing good things will buy you a place in heaven. But when you do good things for people, you are bearing good fruit, bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. Or to paraphrase James, our faith, faith is demonstrating itself through our good works. And Jesus uses the term unrighteous wealth. If you were literally, to literally translate the Greek here, it would read more like the, the mammon of unrighteousness. Mammon is a Greek translation of an Aramaic word for money and possessions, or stuff. Jesus calls it the mammon of unrighteousness, not because of how it was acquired, but because of what it usually leads people to. <coughs> Excuse me. That and its earthly treasure, not heavenly treasure. The mammon of unrighteousness will fail. Treasures in heaven will not fail. Jesus says to make friends by using our earthly treasures. He's not saying that we should go out and buy friends. He's saying that we should be good stewards of what he has given us. Money, stuff, and abilities. And we should use them to be philanthropic toward others. The Greek word translated as friends here is where we get the word philanthropic from. It's like what Paul wrote to Timothy in his first letter to him, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future 
so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. We need to be rich in good works, like Paul tells Timothy. Using our <coughs> mammon of unrighteousness to be philanthropic for God's purposes. After all, it doesn't have any value from an eternal perspective. Even if you convert it all to gold, it's still just pavement. Jesus' next point about the parable is similar, but it expands on what we just saw in verse 9. This is verses 10 through 12. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you who have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? So Jesus starts out with a common sense statement. If you show that you can be entrusted with a small amount of responsibility, you prove, generally speaking, that you can be entrusted with greater responsibility. Any company that promotes people from within the company will follow this way of thinking, generally speaking. You do a good job with the responsibilities that you have and you will get more and more responsibility. But if you don't do well, don't expect to be promoted, and quite possibly expect to be fired. If you cheat when you have a small level of responsibility, you'll keep doing it up the ladder of success if somehow you keep climbing up the ladder of success. In verse 11, Jesus makes a comparison between the mammon of unrighteousness and what he calls true riches. Now this verse parallels the last one. Jesus is saying that the mammon of unrighteousness is the equivalent of very little. But what does he mean by true riches? What about verse 12, when he compares someone else's wealth with your own wealth? I think this is another parallel like the previous verse, the wealth of another is the mammon of unrighteousness, which is very little, or of very little value. However, that which is of real value, what Jesus calls true riches, is actually your own. So during the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says it this way. This is in Matthew 6, starting in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Even if we do store up treasures here on earth, they aren't really ours. Everything here belongs to God. And we're responsible for taking care of it. <clears throat> Everything. By the way, that means people too. The 24th Psalm starts with this statement, Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Everything belongs to God. How can we be trusted with true treasure if we're irresponsible and careless with treasure that belongs to someone else? If we use 
what God has entrusted us with to help others, we are building up treasure in heaven. True riches. Riches that are actually our own because they can't be taken away from us. The value of those real riches is immeasurable because there is no earthly equivalent. The blessing of having a home in heaven is infinitely better than anything you can earn or be given here on earth. So Jesus' final point in this parable is in verse 13 of Luke 16. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And actually the word there is men. This is a warning. It's easy to fall into the trap of serving mammon, working hard to make sure that you have stuff. Trust me, I've been there. Trying to keep up with or be better than your neighbors. I won't say the Joneses. You need to choose who you will serve. You can serve God, or you can focus on stuff. And if you focus on stuff, you will end up serving it. It will take you away from God, because you can't serve both. Paul's, again, in Paul's first letter to Timothy, he explains it this way. 1 Timothy 6.10 For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. One Greek word is translated as the phrase love of money. It's a kind of way, it's kind of like the, the Greek, how the Greek word agape is translated as, as love. <clears throat> but that's not a very full definition of the word to get a full understanding. Love of money doesn't fully define the Greek word here. It's more than that. It's avarice, greed, covetousness, all rolled into one. Money becomes more important than anything else in the world. And like Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and mammon or stuff. So this love of money will cause you to drift away from the faith and can cause you to lose the true wealth that you have in heaven, exchanging it for somebody else's stuff. As Jesus says in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Jesus' parable of the dishonest manager is a great example of learning from someone who is not really a good role model. Both the rich man and his manager were at least a little bit shady. Jesus used the story to help us learn how to deal with the people who aren't like us, those who don't follow him. Just like in the parable of the sower, we need to be sowing the seed and not concerning ourselves with the outcome. 
We can't make seeds grow. All we're supposed to do is sow the seed. God takes care of the rest. Like the dishonest manager that we're looking at today, we need to use what we have to sow those seeds. The, the dishonest manager used his master's wealth to help other people for his own benefit. We need to use our master's wealth, the blessings that God has given us, to help others because of God's love for us. Not so that God will love us. Like I said before, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. <coughs> if we use our earthly blessings to help others, they will be able to share in the eternal heavenly blessings. <coughs> we need to be willing to go out and help others no matter the cost so we can reach as many as possible for Christ. There's your challenge. Let's stand together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born in His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song.
read out of, uh, since we're studying out of Luke, I'm going to fast forward a little bit to Luke chapter 22. And he took the cup when he had given thanks. He said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup after, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. Let's pray for the bread. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you once again for giving us this opportunity to partake of this emblem that represents your son's body, which was beaten, scourged, and tortured for us. We ask that you be with us as we partake in Christ's name and pray. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this cup that represents your son's blood. We pray that we may take this in a manner pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And 742.
pray with the offering. Uh, Luke chapter 21, Jesus looked up and saw, a rich, and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you once again for this time that we're able to share our, our funds. And we ask that you would help us be discerning with the funds that you would help us to uh, continue the work here in Augusta. I pray that we may do so uh, in a manner according to your will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. said Maria's homesick Garrett's not doing well because he's lack of sleep um, this is going to sound a little self-serving but please be praying for Garrett because he has his driver's test tomorrow <laughs> so hopefully he will pass and get his driver's license um, I mean it's nice having a chauffeur so there is that, but that can continue with his, him having his license. So please be praying for him because the plan is that they are going to head back. Garrett is going to head back to Virginia, I think the 28th or the 29th, one or the other, because, uh, his puppy has a vet visit scheduled for the, I think the 28th. So that's uh, coming right up. <laughs> we have a uh, student ministries meeting scheduled for this after this morning, this afternoon, whatever, right after Bible study. Um, don't know that there are a lot of people that are planning on staying, so afterwards we can discuss what's going to happen. Um, tonight at 6, we will have Sing and Snack here at the building, so please come out for that. Sing for an hour or so, and then go downstairs and share some mostly unhealthy food. <laughs> <laughs> Midweek Bible study is Wednesdays at 6.30 here at the building. We are still in Leviticus. But we're getting close. We're getting close. We're past the middle, so we're getting there. Um, next Sunday is potluck, so please be planning for that. And the Monday following, well, next Sunday will be the 11th anniversary of when I started here because my first sermon that I gave here after moving here permanently was on the Sunday before Memorial Day uh, we have a prayer bleh, my tongue is not working we have a prayer breakfast scheduled for Saturday June 1st at 8 a.m. So put that on your calendars, Saturday, June 1st at 8 a.m. here at the building. And Sunday, June 2nd will be the last Sunday that the Thorne family will be here, even though they're not here today. Uh, so this gives us a great opportunity after worship to discuss what we plan to do for their farewell Sunday. Um, 
lots of folks on the prayer list. Please be praying for everybody on the prayer list. I don't think there's anything really new on there. Um, anything else that we, Jonathan? I got a friend of mine that was uh, painting and uh, fell off a ladder and broke his skull. Ouch. He's in, currently he's in ICU in Maine Med down in Portland. Okay, so what's his name? Bill Pelkey. Bill Pelkey? Yes. The plan is, plan is I'm planning on going down to see him um, tomorrow. People wonder why I don't like ladders. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? So uh, we were in Arizona, but in January, um, one of my my team members that I work very closely with, he died quite suddenly at 36 um, of a heart attack. He had been suffering with uh, with leukemia, but he was on the other side of it, and um, just died very suddenly. I got word that his 34-year-old wife passed away this, uh, a couple days ago. And so please be praying for the storm again. John and Aaron storm. They didn't have any children yet. They had not started yet. Okay. Wow, that's hard. Anything else? All right. Closing scripture is coming from Hebrews 13, the first six verses, Hebrews 13, 1 through 6. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison. As though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Thank you for the blessings that you give to us. Help us to use them wisely to further your kingdom, to build up treasures in heaven. Father, we pray for those who have been mentioned today, and the friends and family of John and Aaron Storm, most of all, dealing with the loss. It's almost unfathomable. Father, we pray for those who are sick, for those who are injured and recovering, and those who are fighting with cancer. We pray you will be with them and strengthen them, Father. Give them courage and heal them. Watch over us all, Father, throughout the coming week. Help us to focus on doing your will, Father. Help us to be that example that we need to be. Protect us from harm and from the evil one, Father. Help us to forgive others the way that you forgive us. Watch over us and guide us. In Jesus' name.